all those words, but it's a fascinating uh, adventure, which is really worthwhile because as uh, PhD students and young star, um, uh, academics just after their PhDs, you will only see one part of the journey. Perhaps I have seen many completed PhDs going through life and the way they face life is very different from some days. So, so all those things, the roller coasters and so on, are uh, ticking some boxes uh, in you, which will make you more prepared for life. And also that it's the intellectual advancement, which is like going for a meditation or becoming a, you know, perhaps a priest or whatever, so that you uh, you advance in intellectually. That's what a PhD is. Hmm. Thank you, thank you, Professor Daminda. Dr. Tanuja, so <laughs> you heard several words. So I'm waiting to hear your one. Yeah, I think uh, what uh, I, I too agree with everybody what they were explaining. So it's actually a very complex situation where you cannot just, uh, you know, uh, narrow down it to one single word for, for different people. It, how, it, how do you feel it is a, is a different way? So how do you actually get it is a different way? So we have been seeing people doing this. Uh, and uh, some people um, in the middle, as what uh, Nusrat said, so it's a roller coaster. So at, at one point, some of the some of the students, so they don't get it correctly. So I, I too agree with the, all what you have said. Then being a PhD student, I understand how you feel, and I remember how I felt. And all what you said is right. So it's really difficult, and it's a complex thing. It's a mix of emotions, mix of uh, unit attitudes, mix of perception. So uh, it basically uh, based on how do you really feel it. That's what my thing is. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tanuja. So now we have several words like like transitionary, roller coaster, and and also now we are coming into complex. But one thing stood out, I think, especially from Professor Daminda's description. There is a role of a supervisor here, right? So I think there's a critical part, the relationship between the student and the supervisor. But I think that's a good point we maybe start off on. So um, can you tell us about your student supervisor relationships or what you expect, maybe what you would like to have or what is there for you at the moment? Maybe Tisara, you can start off. Uh, yeah. So uh, like you said, yes, uh, I would uh, highlight the point that I'm very grateful to have my supervisor. So I'm studying under the guidance and supervision of uh, Professor Sarat Dasanayak and Dr. Dinesh Samarasingha. So I'm honestly blessed and grateful for the understanding that they have and also the immensely valuable knowledge that they have. So I would also highlight the fact that they're more practical so than theoretical based. So that is sort of like a very uh, privilege because uh, I honestly got a very uh, valuable practical exposure, not only from a theoretical perspective of the concepts, but also from a practical point of view. So I honestly don't have anything to change because uh, it's really, yeah, so I am I'm privileged and I'm blessed uh, to study under such guidance and supervision. Dr. Tanuja, maybe you have something to weigh in here? Yeah, I think uh, I'm weighing in here by adding things what, uh, to uh, what she said, that Isara said. I, I too agree on what she said. This you had of two fantastic supervisors because uh, <laughs> I'm working two of them with some of the PhD students, uh, with even Professor Sarabh being a pan, uh, chairman of my, my progressive panel of one of my PhD students. And, and with Dinesh, I'm supervising, co supervising. Dinesh is a co supervisor of one of my PhD students. So I know both of them are fantastic. So other than that about this PhD supervision role, I believe um, uh, you have to play multiple roles. You can't play the same role with every student. It has to be a unique role. It has to be a unique role by understanding the student properly. So from the beginning, you should know not only about the knowledge level, so about uh, what, what the student is passionate about, what the student is able to do and what he or she is lacking. And, uh, and the background of the student, the family, uh, and all that. If you are to, if you are to um, support the student, I believe that you should know every other aspect of the student. Because supervising some of the students are not difficult because they are self-motivated and they are very passionate. And, but they need something else sometimes. But sometimes then you need 
probably motivate you. you you should push them to you know do publications and you know uh, go forward you know fastly and do things innovative things but some students you know probably they they have some other other things because all what you do is used as a, at one point some students so i believe it's it's a mix of roles it's not just one role that you can play for every phd students it's a different from every phd students that i supervise so it's not the same role that i play it's different roles that i play all the time yeah Dr. Nusrat, maybe you have something to add here uh yeah i agree with uh, both uh, sarah and dr tanuja uh, so but my experience was actually quite opposite to Tan uh, tisara's because i did a highly theoretical study so um, for me, I think with uh, my supervisor, so I worked under the guidance of Professor Rohinton Emmanuel, who is actually an alumni of University of Waratua, and uh, Dr. Craig Thompson. So for me, what was important was because I did a highly theoretical study, they were quite flexible and laid back. They actually gave me the freedom to explore different options, different choices. Some things worked out, some things didn't, but then they were always supportive throughout the entire journey and gave me the full freedom to explore all these options, gave me the time. So I really appreciated that personally. Yeah. Right. Nice to hear, Dr. Nasra. Professor Daminder. So. Yeah, look, uh, it's uh, interesting. To, uh, so I, uh, again, uh, agree with uh, Dr. Tanuja. And uh, what uh, Tirasura and Nostrat did actually validates uh, this because uh, two different people, two different PhDs. So it's not only the individual. It's the PhD, what your research is about as well. So in combination, this means these are unique, like right? uh, each, each PhD uh, and the PhD researcher in combination make each PhD so very much unique. So I would say a good supervisor is a person who understands this. In some cases, the supervisor may not be uh, a, a, a real expert in that area. I have seen such cases, but still a, a very, very good supervisor. Mm -hmm. So uh, the person who can mentor, guide, direct, and also point out and connect the PhD student with the right people, uh, and uh, the networks uh, and help the person grow and mature uh, uh, over. So, uh, and of course, putting a PhD. So, for example, in a long time ago, during my PhD, I had two supervisors. My main supervisor wasn't really an uh, uh, expert in my area, uh, but he was the person who helped me to put my thesis together. Right? So, because he's a very, very experienced supervisor um, uh, with many PhD completions. And also he understood uh, me and, uh, uh, and of course, because of his experience, he could guide me and, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, understood my writing style. I had a way of so writing very, very, uh, in, in a very um, short sort of um, uh, sentence, uh, long sentences, but very short paragraphs. So that I, I tried to get uh, to write things in very concise manner. And he said, no, because an Australian PhD is a book, which is a self-contained uh, sort of uh, book. Uh, compared to some European and so on, uh, different PhD. So he helped me to change my way of writing so that it can become that book that is self-contained book. So again, that's one example. But again, um, uh, going back to Dr. Panerjee, it's a uh, unique. So understand this individual, but not just in academically and research-wise, but who this person is. Uh, uh, because there will be, for example, for, I have <laughs> gone through over the 35 odd PhDs that I've been involved in uh, supervising, uh, people who got married, who, who get separators and divorce, many babies. <laughs> uh, <I've, laughs> those have been very happy to sort of. Uh, so there have been the four husband wife couples who were PhD students who graduated, and all four of them graduated together. So a lot of experience, but each of these, even if it's a husband and wife, the two of them will be very different. So we have to work with them in a very different way as well. Again, many stories I can tell, but I guess another time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we, so we will take the stories in a bit. Yeah, so keep, them, <laughs> keep them in line. <laughs> right, so one of the things that came up, like there are different research cultures. I think that's one of the things that build up between the supervisor and the PhD student, a certain, a certain research culture. So uh, Dr. Nosra, so can you tell us about the research culture or the research life in your PhD journey? 
Yeah, sure. So for us uh, in our university, so uh, our university claims that it's a university for the common good. And we value support and collaboration about uh, uh, like highly, I should say, like highly value support and collaboration. And I think I can kind of uh, agree with uh, what Professor Daminda was saying, where um, sometimes our supervisors may not be the expert in what uh, the field or the area that we are choosing. But always we had this kind of team effort where we are always directed to someone in our network of uh, either another colleague or a lecturer to kind of support us if they don't have the expertise to guide us in a certain area. Like for example, when I wanted to learn a certain software, if my supervisor is uh, not an expert in that area, he would always direct me to someone in the university who can help me out with that. And similarly, if there is another student or someone who wants uh, an expert advice from an area that I am competent in, they would always come to me. So it's all about collaboration and support, teamwork. So that was the research culture in our university. Right. Thank you, Dr. Nusrat. Ms. Tisara, what about you? Yes, I agree with uh, what Dr. Nusrat said. So that is very correct. And I think it's the very uh, same at uh, University of Moritua as well. So I... I honestly experienced that sort of now I am at the, I, I just entered, I think, to the journey. So I actually felt the difference. And I think that is the very reason I don't regret the decision of joining with University of Morocco because I have, I have studied at different other local universities as well. But to be honest, I have felt the difference. Uh, now my research is more into the practical aspect. So I have, I have, experience that practical knowledge and that thinking the lecturers and even my supervisors has. So that is something uh, which actually stand out from the other university cultures as well, I would say. Right, Dr. Tanoja, do you concur or? <laughs> I, I think, like uh, university of yes, the uh, Moratua culture is exactly what she has been explaining because you have just started, you may, observe uh, and see how, how we do and not because that I'm I'm representing University of Morito I actually know how things are happening so uh, now it shouldn't be what I believe is it shouldn't be an individual journey it, should, it always has to be a collaborative sharing and network thing so uh, now, even University of Maratua, uh, we being PhD supervisors, uh, we sometimes get advices from various different people, people who come, you know, you know, with the different backgrounds. So we direct them into different people. So it's always there. So uh, and the system support is also has been given by faculty of graduate studies, always reminding. And sometimes with the hectic schedules, we we couldn't understand, we couldn't find these, um, you know. Um, deadlines and what to do and all that. So system support is also given from University of Morito. Uh, but uh, as you know, human perspectives, I, I believe University of Morito, yes, true. We, we do have a very friendly culture. You can come and uh, do various things, even uh, it's 24 hours, it's open. Uh, you can come, but uh, you know, even the library and research, uh, you know, units and uh, the, some of the departments, they have different uh, units uh, created for different uh, research students as such. So yes, true, true. I agree with what uh, she said. It's um, yes, you know, City of Moratu is a fantastic place for you to come and uh, join as a PhD student. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very friendly and very flexible in that manner. Yes. So up to uh, un, 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 unless you 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 are just breaking the rules, you, you are just uh, even, even we we do have very flexible uh, environment here, um, and FGS is brilliantly handling it. And uh, yes, true, yes. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tanacha. Yes. So, uh, Professor Damind, so what is the culture you hope to instill in your students? What's the culture or the research life over there? Uh, look, um, the culture, I think uh, uh, the, the, the different uh, panelists, I think uh, I uh, agree, agree with this. So, in terms of, uh, because uh, what we get, it's a PhD, it's a Doctor of Philosophy. Of course, there are certain uh, countries, like in Germany, there's Doctor of Engineering and so on, which is slightly different, but it's mostly a Doctor of Philosophy. And uh, my um, uh, um, uh, thinking is that it's an, uh, what, so you enter 
uh, as a particular individual. And then that's a, uh, over the four, whatever, five and sometimes more years, there's an intellectual advancement that happens that gains you the doctor of philosophy. So as a supervisor, students have asked me, how do you know when uh, I am ready to submit? Or do I have to do this, this thing? And say, yes, of course, we agree on a certain plan and the plan does change as you do your research and we find things and then find the problems, find the things that won't work and so on. But the day that I decide that you are now ready is not based on your work, but uh, the, when you start giving me ideas, uh, directing me, pointing out the things that I'm sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, my way of thinking, you know, because you are becoming an expert in that particular niche area and uh, a, a much better, more expert, better, even if it's my area, that niche area, you are becoming better or, or a better thinker, better, uh, much more of an expert. And I, I can, I can, I start feeling that then you're, you're ready for your, uh, for your PhD. So uh, coming with, uh, in terms of culture, it, it will differ. For example, one of the panelists say, as I said, that it's a very theory, not just, I think, very theoretical to uh, this sort of very, this sort of very um, uh, practical. So yes, that's uh, so, so very, very different. But again, uh, the, the, the intellectual advancement will be achieved in different ways. But it's something like you build up your confidence, the ability to work on your own with less and less uh, uh, supervision guidance or direct guidance. Uh, then, of course, ability to communicate and pass on your ideas and thoughts in a, um, in a way that an audience can understand. All that is part of that. And so the environment, the opportunities that we provide to enable that is the culture. Uh, and in our area of artificial intelligence and so on, it's not only academic because majority of my PhDs, uh, probably 80 to 90% uh, go into industry because industry, the small and large are becoming, research, have their own research, right? not just the Googles and Amazons and so on, Microsofts, but even small companies, SMEs and startup companies are uh, doing research and the, the students are going to. So in, enabling them to do that, uh, where the person I identify is uh, prefers to go into industry after PhD rather than an academic career. So again, I know that it's uh, many things uh, and we can talk a lot more, but generally it's that intellectual advancement, the confidence, the maturity, uh, and of course the communication ability, ability to express yourself in a way that uh, uh, somebody can uh, from the, um, sort of understand all that and the environment that enables that, I would say. Is a, very interesting, Professor Damin. So I think sort of like from Tisara to Professor Damin, we painted a picture from beginning to starting to help others along the way. So I think we have a, a good uh, description of this path now. I, I like one of the things now, uh, uh, now at the bottom of this uh, discussion, we came up like ability to communicate one's knowledge or like to share it. I think one of the uh, obstacles that the students face along the way is getting published, right? writing and then being published. So, uh, Tisara and uh, Dr. Nusrat, maybe you can now enlighten us. Uh, can you describe your, right, your academic writing and publication process? Maybe Dr. Nusrat can kick things off? Uh, yeah, so I think it's uh, entirely different depending on where you're publishing and what you're publishing. So, uh, in terms of writing, I think, there is no one right way to do it. So for each instance, it's totally different. Uh, but usually um, when we are writing for a publication, for example, if it's a journal, I would say I start somewhere in the middle with uh, the method methodology and uh, then go into discuss the uh, ana analysis results and discussion and then go to the beginning of the introductions and that threat. And you know, when we are publishing, you have so many factors to take into account, like uh, uh, how the site indexes are and uh, what your target audience is and uh, who you want to reach out to. So it, uh, where you want to publish and what type of uh, publication you're working on will totally depend on so many factors. And depending on that, uh, how you approach it would be totally different. Uh, but usually in general, I would say you would start with a very rough draft, then go back and forth uh, 
with your supervisors or co-authors to kind of refine it, look at the what are the uh, requirements of, uh, let's say if it's a journal article, what are the requirements of a certain journal, and then refine it, then it goes into a review, you get feedback, and then again, it's a process of uh, editing, cutting, chopping, and rewriting, and then um, finally getting into publication. So it's quite a, sometimes can be quite a long process, and there might be different approaches to do it. Right. Thank you, Dr. Nusrat. I think you almost did my job as well, so I didn't <laughs> need to describe the process. So, Tisara. So, uh, so yes, I, I agree with Dr. Nusrat what she said, because it is different from one uh, approach to another and also the study area and also I believe to one person to another also because it's about how you transform your as in like how you put your ideas and how you put your knowledge and your uh, your thinking and all that into a paper. So analysis and also my needs are uh, quite different than what Dr. Nusrat said, because I actually organize myself in a way when I'm writing, I first think in the points of uh, what, why, and how, and then only I organize it. So basically what, what part I connect with the introduction and why I mainly connect with the literature, basically like backing up with the evidences and then how is mainly linked with the methodology. So that is how I organize. And uh, like Dr. Nusrat very correctly said, uh, it is also depend and different from uh, the publication sources as well and also the publishers. And uh, Another point I would also like to highlight that actually uh, I think train you as a person because it's not always about getting accepted but also getting rejected as well. So you actually get the opportunity to learn more uh, from the failures as in like you also like that is sort of like an enlightening a point that I experience because I'm sort of a person who has a difficulty when it comes to accepting the rejection. So I like every one of us, we don't like it. So it sort of takes the day for me to emotionally prepare and then again to sort of develop the version. So when it comes to again, so it's actually, uh, I would say, uh, I think the right word would be enlightening because uh, that actually uh, trained me to not, not to give up. So to not to stop from there, but to target the other, other sources and the other opportunities. So that's something that uh, I appreciate about the journey. Thank you, Tisara. So Dr. Tanuja and Professor Daminder. So I would like to rephrase that question for you. Uh, so uh, how do you guide your students through this uh, academic writing and publication process? Maybe Dr. Tanuja can start. Well, um, guide in the sense like uh, different write-ups uh, like uh, diff for different um, levels of research, uh, which determines what to write and uh, where to write. So uh, you can't just start write, start writing at the beginning stages because it's always you know uh, ups and downs. You 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 don't really understand what to write and uh, what to do. And apart from writing, you have the entire research to you know you know plan and do. So I think if the supervisor's uh, role is to understand uh, what what and when to write. And also where to write, uh, because uh, some students um, we have seen, uh, they have been publishing even journal level articles to some of these uh, local level conferences. If they add a little bit more, they could have been published a good journal. So, and, and uh, but the good journals also, you need to understand, you need to identify and appropriateness of the journal to your your uh, you know type of a research your area of research i think supervisor has to guide the student in that way and the other thing is i too agree with with uh, what mr said because uh, you your your way of writing fashion you have to understand because not everybody is starting from you know uh, a and finishing from z so every probably you start from m or n or where in the middle of your research and you go here and there and write so um, you you it's the supervisor's role is to actually to guide and to say okay you do uh, you you can you know um, 
come up with an outcome like this. So that's that happens in different stages of the research. So you can't probably, sometimes you can't find a publication within six months. So there's no pointing of we pressurizing the students because if you can't publish uh, a thing, because sometimes you are lost in the middle, you can't uh, focus on writing, you, you are not in a, in a writing mindset. So we have to understand and we have to guide the students properly. Uh, if you are to get a good uh, publication out from the student. Thank you, Dr. Tanaji. Mr. Damin, yeah. I think um, uh, it's been a good discussion. So just to <clears throat> add a couple of things. Yes, uh, I agree. Generally, uh, starting uh, writing a publication, uh, the, the publication itself. So starting in the middle because the methodology and if there's experimentation and results and se section, that's something that you want to get done. Methodology, you know, uh, results uh, you will get. And based on that, obviously, uh, the rest of the paper, how uh, your uh, introduction, uh, the literature survey, and so on, and uh, the, the conclusions, in especially the introduction and conclusions will depend on what this is. Um, but of course, um, um, uh, for as a supervisor, uh, uh, it's, I think, uh, our duty to sort of point out when uh, there is material for a paper and what kind of, sometimes this could be uh, just a literature survey uh, because you surveyed and there's some valuable. So what, why do you write a paper? You write a paper because uh, you have collected some um, material, done some experiments and some interesting outcomes, interesting thoughts in some cases, not uh, necessarily uh, practical uh, outcomes, but uh, thoughts and ideas um, and frameworks and um, um, uh, conceptual, uh, uh, sort of frameworks that you have put together that would be of value to other researchers or in some cases uh, other um, uh, it could be industry it could be uh, other interested parties and that's why you write a paper unfortunately there is a whole game as we all know that uh, which is uh, yeah because uh, uh, people's promotions too many other things are uh, depend on publication so there is this uh, uh, publish or perish game and so on but that that's another fact that one as a researcher you publish because you want to communicate this idea get other researchers and other interested parties to um, uh, to, um, to 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 get to know this so that they can also build upon this so uh, and again uh, dr Dungus, uh, where do you publish after that so uh, do is there material to publish where do you publish identify uh, so there's the impact factors there's the a uh, number of other, the, the prestige in some cases, impact factor is low because of various reasons, the way it's calculated, but it's a, a journal that is really, uh, it, it'll, um, um, that, uh, it, it will uh, connect to the right audience and so on. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, where, where do you publish uh, is another, uh, another factor. And then uh, coming back to the Tisaras, then uh, once the outcome, uh, you receive the outcome, if it's, a, if it's a rejection with some really, really harsh comments, you know, uh, being able to sort of take it, uh, take a hard punch, fall, and then get up. That's another thing that as a supervisor, you'll have to support. I had uh, a, a, a young lady, uh, a Sri Lankan, I <laughs> give the name, Mr. Moro to her, uh, excellent, <laughs> who used to cry like, you know, the, uh, for, for hours <laughs> once when, when she gets uh, <laughs> rejection. So uh, yeah, PhD supervisor <laughs> will have to be, you know, go on with that. And But uh, she did uh, persevere and uh, got a very, very good PhD with about six <laughs> very good publications. So, so uh, yeah. Okay, like, very interesting. Uh, so now I would like to like, uh, like switch gears for a bit. So I was go I'm going to hold uh, Dr. Nostrad to her, to her roller coaster ride, right? Uh, so can you tell us about some uh, right, unforgettable experiences, like interesting stories from your journey so far? Um, I think uh, one, one of the most uh, interesting experiences I personally have was uh, getting one of my uh, papers accepted to present at uh, the American Meteorological Society's uh, conference held in New York in 2018. So uh, the opportunity I got to actually go visit New York and then present my work there and also meet uh, so many experts in that field, uh, leading researchers, you know, speak to them personally. It was like a real, you know, fangirl moment for me because, you know, to go and speak to them personally, exchange ideas. So I think uh, one uh, very uh, rewarding uh, experience I think most PhD students get is, 
you know, the ability to attend conferences, see new places, meet new people, experience new cultures. So yeah, that I think was an exciting opportunity. Right. Interesting, Dr. Nasra. So, Sarah, what about you? Any uh, yes. interesting experiences so far? So yes, I agree with what Dr. Nusrat said because I have also experienced the same. So it's actually like if I talk about all the good experience or that uh, uh, accepting uh, the publications and the publishing articles in a book and uh, all sort of recognition and uh, that, that uh, actually is a very nice experience. And also about, uh, about uh, so about uh, as in like I told you about the transition. So as in like now, when I, when I first entered to the PhD journey, it was sort of like, to be honest, kind of like, you know, sort of like messy as in like, you know, I'm trying to sort of connect the dots. And I, I actually present, uh, uh, I actually present a proposal and then developed it. And then I wrote like, you know, pages and pages, and then it, totally get changed and then I start again and that sort of experiences are very uh, very valuable I would say so it's it's very nice so when I look back it's like when I first entered like I told you it was like sort of messy so I'm like trying to connect the dots and then come to see what really this is and now I feel I sort of have an idea so it's like dots are connecting so that sort of an experience is very nice. No, uh, then maybe Professor Damin and uh, Dr. Kanuja, uh, what about any teachable or interesting moments that you can share about your PhD supervision experience? Maybe Dr. Maybe Dr. Professor Damin can start. Look, um, there's uh, there are many uh, teachable, uh, I guess, uh, uh, many examples, but uh, something that I can, I guess, uh, talk about is perseverance and importance of that. So there was a, uh, this uh, uh, again, uh, young lady who was a PhD student. And then uh, I noticed after a few months that uh, I, whenever I come up come to the office or the lab that I can see her crying and so on. And after, I mean, uh, initially I thought oh, it could be some, uh, you know, some small incident, but then when it, uh, uh, saw this uh, over a couple of weeks, I called her and said, you know, come on, let's have uh, coffee and discuss uh, what, what is up. Then she came up that, uh, a really bad experience. So she's married, husband is not there, but uh, very abusive and so on, uh, husband and so on. So, and she was then uh, over the next few months going through a divorce and all kinds of things. But uh, uh, I managed to sort of, um, um, sort of, uh, sort of, they said, do you want it, um, uh, um, to, 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 to stop the PhD for a while and so on? But the scholarship was important to her as well. So there were, so these are the things that a PhD supervisor has to do because there are the financial issues, there are the visa issues, so because of this person, international student, uh, family. So, so this is where I think, uh, going back to what Dr. Tanuja was talking about, it's not the PhD research that a supervisor has to worry about. So I had was somehow determined to help this girl, young lady to sort of uh, go through the process and. So, um, uh, so there are many instances uh, uh, given, uh, of course, less of flexibility. Uh, so if you really want to sort of uh, not to stop and then uh, continue as she was going through this bad experience. But the uh, long story, but the, the, the detail is that so far, finally the visa ran out uh, and, but we finally so worked to a hard deadline to get a first draft done so that uh, this was a uh, Monash University uh, when I was at Monash uh, on, um, in Melbourne. The university agreed to let her uh, do the final stages uh, up to six months initially or maximum one year from her own country uh, so that uh, she could go back with something uh, saying that, okay, I have achieved something, so there is hope. Otherwise, you'd have gone back and nothing would have. But, uh, the, so the, but finally, it's, it's, it's a, a happy ending <laughs> because uh, not only did she... Uh, you know, get got out of the. She got out of the abusive marriage. She's uh, remarried now, mother of two <laughs> two children, and a senior lecturer in a in a, in a university, and uh, very much in touch. And when I do visit, uh, uh, we meet and so on and so on. So she's supervising uh, PhD students now. So so look, uh, perseverance and going through such bad, difficult times, but somehow sticking to your uh, task. I guess that's uh, one of the many <laughs> uh, very. I guess interesting, but in a, it's a sad, but uh, a sad story, but with a very, very good uh, ending. 
Dr. Tanuja. Yeah. Any stories uh, from you? Yeah, I, I um, yeah, I, it was a very interesting story that uh, Professor Alhakun was sharing. I, I uh, too, I'll tell you one story. So, um, one of the most interesting thing what has happened to me is uh, a friend coming as a PhD student of yours, right? So I'm supervising one of my good friends uh, who is a PhD student, an academic, a senior academic in a local university. And, um, and he's a very um, sort of a very knowledgeable person uh, with good communication skills, uh, good writing skills, and he's a really, really good academic. Has a lot of you know experience in um, academia. Now he he has two things, two problems that I encountered. Uh, he needs a lot of you know um, motivation to. I I had to you know um, put a lot of effort in you know convincing him that he can do things. What he has as a problem is that he has, you know, only about five, six publications until this about, you know, 10, 12 years of his academic uh, life. He, he's totally into administration. He's, a, he's, a so, he's so good in university administration, good administrator. Uh, and, and university was like, uh, you know, uh, promoting him for all these administrative work rather doing research. So he's not believing him in, in him where he can actually a, a doable person in research. So my biggest challenge was that to convince him, yes, you can do that and you should do that. So uh, now I, I think I did it. And like in a couple of weeks back, he, he actually presented uh, his second paper from the PhD. And in that uh, conference, he actually won the best paper and the best presenter award, both together. It's a very rare chance a person gets the best paper and the best presenter award. So he, he won both in an international conference in out, outside. I don't remember exactly the country, in Indonesia or Malaysia. So now he believes. So after doing that, he, he said, yes, look, I can do it now. So uh, my, my, my task was not to correct his you know, papers to, to tell him what to do. And, you know, he knows everything, you know, about journals and publishers and indexers and everything he knows. Only thing is that he is not having, that believes in him that he can, he can do things. So I think um, uh, my approach was, was good. I was pushing him about one year to do, get this, get this one paper done, just one paper done. I had to push him over one year. Right, because he was just saying so many things and postponing stuff and all that. But he he is a doable person. So now he's believing in him. I think that makes me me feel really happy about me as a supervisor because I I felt that what I did was right. Right? What I did was right. And the other thing was like since he's a he's a good friend of mine, I I can shout him and you know, but there's a limit that you can, you know fight with your friend but not as a supervisor but as a friend so I took so many different approaches to convince him that yes you can do that <laughs> so so many I, I know there are a lot of stories but I think mean, we are time limited so sadly we will not have we will not be able to share all of them right so one thing that stood out PhD journey stressful anxious or oh. Is it depression inducing? <laughs> right. So, uh, Dr. Nostrad and Disara, can you tell us how do you manage this uh, stressful trip or journey? Well, I mean, how, what is the secret behind your work life balance? So, Tisara, maybe you can start. Uh, well, yeah. So, at the beginning, it was very difficult to be honest. I wouldn't say that I was all, you know, superb at managing everything and uh, was able to, you know, uh, balance. It, it's not uh, work, life, it's work, study, and life. So, 
three things together and also i recently got married uh, so there's a uh, transition in the personal aspect as well but i'm grateful because all my family and my husband are very supportive and very understanding and uh, they also they have experience so they are also into you know learning so they appreciate the uh, learning journey so in that regard i think that is one of my biggest strength so i think that has actually helped me to manage myself and to enter to this journey so thereby i have gradually i wouldn't say that it happened all of a sudden so if i look back it honestly took like a year for me to settle down so the first year was very challenging so i actually missed deadlines and uh, that is why i told you my supervisors they are very understandable so they so they understand that the life is also there so uh, so so i think it it gradually happened so it's like uh, it's like not easy very challenging but also uh, fruitful dr nosrat how about you what's your secret I couldn't agree more with Tisara. It was the same for me. I was a total mess in the first year, you know, going. It, I was all over the place trying to identify, you know, what is happening. And especially for me, it was very different because I had just moved into a new country, new place, new culture, you know, trying to find my way out, way around. And then, you know, I was also newly married. I had a baby in the middle of. Uh, my journey uh, i lost my mother in the middle of the journey and then the pandemic hit so so many ups and downs which is why i actually said that it was a roller coaster ride so for me personally two things that helped me was learning to switch off you know when when the time comes to kind of switch off especially during the weekends take my time off really spend time with family and uh, even the you know long distance calls daily to my home really helped so you know learning to differentiate between the work study and uh, you know my personal life and learning to switch off was very important uh, and the other thing was uh, time management definitely you know learning to manage even during if it is a very short time that i am working for like let's say it's 5 hours i tried to use different techniques and actually uh, one technique that really worked for me while doing my phd was using a pomodoro technique i don't know if you heard of it where you use a 50 10 um, schedule where you work for 50 minutes take 10 minute breaks again a 50 minute work 10 minute break so that really helped me kind of push me especially during the writing stages to keep my focus but also keep my energy so that i don't drain out at the end of the day because i was taking you know those 10 minute intervals in between that really helped me kind of uh, see the whole process through thank you dr nasra so let me tell you i use the same technique but i use 20 and 10 i think <laughs> 20 minutes was uh, not in, i actually tried that as well but i did, it didn't work for me because i felt that you know the uh, breaks were coming too soon so <laughs> So maybe so I stuck for fifty and ten. <laughs> yeah, maybe I, I needed more breaks. <laughs> right. So, uh, Professor Damwinda, Dr. Tanuja. So, should a PhD candidate's life be stressful? What do you think? Uh, how should they manage their work, Dr. Tanuja? Uh, in a way, it's yes and no. There should be a little bit of pressure as well, because otherwise you will not be able to go into your deadlines if you just do, you know, relax and do your stuff. I don't think it it has to be the case. And the other thing is that absolutely not. You don't have to be stressful because always, if you if you have a problem, there's a way of resolving it. So at a point where you resolve it, your stress goes. Ah. Uh, what i believe is always like in any other thing in your life even in the phd proper planning has to be happen so not a student alone can do that i think we as the supervisors we should support the students always what to do and uh, when to do and um, how to do sort of things so the detail plan uh, what i do basically is at the um, 
even before uh, registering to the PhD, what I do is with my students, I lay out the whole plan. It takes about so many hours for me to do that. So all the, even the objectives and stuff like that, the methodology and stuff. So basic, it's the plan. This There are terms you take when you actually do that. But if you see the end of the journey, the student is also starting with a, you know, um, with something that, okay, I see the end. Now, if you start with just with, a, with an idea and then you start, you know, doing that alone, the student, I don't think it has to be the case. I think the supervisor's role in, in that phase is, is from the beginning, you should see the end where you have to stand still at one point as the supervisor where you looked at the student where you actually move. So um, there can be different turns, but there has to be a one single ending point where the student is going to be landed. So you as the supervisor, always this plan has to be there. Now, most of the students, why they get stressed out is because you don't, uh, you don't see that. And also you don't have the proper, um, you know, time management. You don't, time management in the sense like not the daily time management. Within the period of PhD, you should manage your time. Because otherwise you can't say, look here, your time out. Now you should quit because you you are the supervisor and the student. It's the both both the parties' responsibility is to you know draw these this uh, entire map and to see that. And now there are things happen like I I too have one of the student who who married and came and then uh, she she had a baby in the middle and when she when she comes she has one baby is about five, six months, and then she had a, another baby. So she, I mean, like in the, I know as a mother, I know it's really difficult when you have a kid, it's 24 seven, you need to give attention to a, a kid. So even with that, you need to manage the work. So I think planning has to be there. So you you as a supervisor, definitely assume you need to give 100%, 200% support for the students to lay this thing down and to see where the, the, the research ultimately is going to be ended up and where the student is going to land. So the supervisor's role is that, not just saying, okay, it's not only about the expertise where maybe it's your, maybe your, your in computer sciences, mechanical engineering or whatsoever, it's not the expertise is about, it's about the whole journey. The supervisor has to be an expert in the whole journey, not the subject matter expert only. I don't think that only helps. Thank you, Dr. Kanaja. So, Professor Darminder. Yeah, no, 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 fully, fully agree. Uh, so, it's that uh, uh, being there and uh, basically uh, traveling uh, on the journey with the student and helping the student with that, uh, the, the, the plan, the time management, and, and also uh, reminding uh, where we are. So, positioning, okay, where we are here, this is where you have to go, and this is what you need to do. And that, of course, adjusts. Uh, that's where the because it's, uh, the, we set up a plan at the beginning. Uh, sometimes, depending on the person, I saw, even come up with, you know, uh, this is what, so this is the topic, this is what we have discussed, these are the potential research, the research questions. And this could even be your thesis structure. And uh, I like sort of uh, drawing the uh, uh, whiteboard or a piece of paper and come up. And then, oh, okay, this is, and this could be your thesis structure. Of course, it's going to uh, change. Uh, the, the completely uh, uh, as, as the months and the years go by, but uh, that gives uh, sort of okay the, the very structured sort of because we I guess uh, we have to learn to live in uh, this very unstructured and chaotic world. But uh, we feel comfortable when there is structure. We we sort of we, our sort of mind holds on to it. So providing that uh, that mentally the sort of that. Uh, it's, I don't want to call it a cage, but a template where you feel comfortable and secure in, I guess, is uh, 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 the, the, uh, the part, the role of, of, of a, uh, uh, the supervisor. And that will reduce stress. But again, going back to Dr. Anjou's uh, first point, the stress will be there. Stress, aren't we? Uh, I mean, I finished PhD 20 years ago. I'm, uh, I still feel stressed uh, <laughs> in, in, in uh, many situations. So uh, it's, it's part of life. So uh, perhaps learning to live with that, just like they, these people are telling us to learn to live with COVID. <laughs> so <laughs> perhaps that's part of the training, <laughs> PhD training as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Professor Damien. So uh, so sort of now we are now 
come a long way along this journey as well. So in a way, now I think we should like like uh, take time out, uh, like looking back on the process. So uh, maybe uh, Dr. Nosrat. So what would you say? Uh, uh, any perspective that uh, changed from when you began versus now where you are? Um, yes, uh, one perspective that definitely has changed for me was uh, the importance of uh, networking and collaboration. Mm. So I didn't uh, think, you know, I thought, okay, this is my very specific research and, you know, uh, the others are not going to be understanding or uh, would get what I am doing. But uh, later on, as I progressed, I really found it important that I uh, attend different networking opportunities, share my work with others, uh, because the feedback that I get, even if it is from a non-expert person, it could be from the general public. You know, I attended different uh, uh, showcases for general public and stuff. So that input that you get from different people, from different opinions, from different outlooks really helps you to uh, mold your research. Sometimes there might be points that you totally miss while doing your research, but when you get that outside opinion, uh, it really helps. And so I think, you know, definitely uh, networking and uh, experience with sharing your knowledge with others is a very important thing that changed yeah. for me personally. Thank you, Dr. Nasrat. Yeah. yeah, so let me break away for a minute. Okay, I want to now come back to again, Dr. Tanuja and Professor Daminder. So in this PhD journey, uh, the, how important is this networking for this exposure to the industry, maybe collaborators, maybe the general public, maybe you can weigh in a little bit, Dr. Tanuja? Dr. Tanuja. Yeah, I, I, I prefer if Dr. Daminda goes because Professor Daminda goes because he has more much more experience than Professor Daminda. Yeah, you can start. Yeah. <laughs> Look, uh, yeah, it, it for me, uh, and I think it's uh, for anybody. I'm sure every uh, PhD supervisor, it's it's one of the most important uh, parts of the of, of of the PhD training. So we call it PhD training. Um, so. Um, uh, it, my, I had so I had two uh, um, uh, supervisors in my PhD this long time ago, and one of them uh, is, uh, is much more focused on getting the thesis uh, done and so on, while the other was a person who used to organize conferences, who used to uh, you know uh, participate and set up uh, journal editorships and all kinds of things. And even during my PhD, got me involved. And one is uh, one uh, particular <laughs> incident so that I can very quickly say is that. So there was this uh, conference. I was a PhD student two years into my PhD and conference in Japan, and he was uh, supposed to chair a, 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 a session. session. Uh, and, uh, and suddenly last minute he said, oh, I won't be able to go. Uh, can you go and uh, chair? <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> what do I know? I, I said, no, 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 I already sort of, uh, you know, you, you go, I'll, I'll get you. So I was there, I went in and then uh, they, and he has somehow forgotten to tell that this was a PhD student. <laughs> so he has said, my colleague, I'm, so they obviously thought that he was one of the, another academic in his, in his team. So they called me a uh, doctor, uh, then come and then so I was just two, two, uh, second year in, in my PhD. I was terrified, but uh, look, uh, again, uh, an example where I had to sort of somehow sort of strengthen my sort of resolve. Okay, now, so I had to pre I prepare the lot more than I guess many other academic prepared the questions because you know if the audience uh, uh, there was no questions questions from the audience obviously you are supposed to ask questions and there were about six uh, six papers very theoretical uh, fuzzy logic and so on which the Japanese were very you know, big on those days uh, but it went really well and that gave me incredible confidence oh, okay, no? so I can actually you know complete uh, one day I, I'll be able to do this so get, the networking academic as well as I think industry, that's something that, because I work very closely with University of Moratua and I believe uh, University of Moratua, uh, the reputation itself, I would say the most prominent, uh, 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 especially um, uh, technical <laughs> university in the country, in here or any other country, you normally you have to go after industry and try and uh, attract their attention and so on interest. I have seen uh, top industries lining up 
uh, to come and work with the University of Morocco. When I was there, so uh, when I uh, come there, I know that there's the top companies. Uh, so I have made so much connections. I worked with some of the leading companies and still do in Sri Lanka because of the reputation. So what do we get here? Because you, uh, it's important because to, to seeing a problem or the world from different ties or different dimensions or different angles. Um, and that, that's what networking does. But networking is not only that. So there's the academic side, there's the industry and others, but also people with uh, very different fields. That's something really important. As a PhD student, I try to get my student to participate in what do they call uh, the, these PhD forums or workshops and so on where uh, PhD students from very different fields get together. So in our case, it could be social sciences, it could be and humanities, it could be health and so on. It's really important because finally to be creative. And, and in many cases, we have used uh, psychological models of you know, how uh, our mind works and so on, and then build computational models of that uh, for, for you know, artificial intelligence and cognitive science research. Uh, so, so this is where working with others, it's really an important factor in, uh, um, in even providing you sort of ideas. And also as a researcher, I think it's, the world is moving in such a way. I work really closely with health researchers. So um, uh, for example, large grants with neuroscientists uh, who are working with people after the recovery after stroke uh, so, and so on. So again, networking. So it's during a PhD that you build up this uh, uh, the, the ability, the confidence, the ability to uh, not just to communicate, but even have uh, you know casual chit chat with people over drinks and so on, so that uh, you get to work and really enjoy that conversation. Uh, and, and I guess that's one of the most satisfying, most fascinating <clears throat> uh, things of being an academic. Uh, so I can I'll tell you that because I have even friends, I would say, all over the world, from Africa to the Asia to the US, to uh, work very close with Sweden and uh, uh, the Scandi several Scandi Finland, Sweden, Norway, and several Scandinavian countries all over the world. And some of these people I have never seen, of course, now because of Zoom and, uh, and so on. And suddenly you meet and uh, the, you go for a conference and so on, meet, and we really have a really, really nice time. I, so I have been in and out of industry many times. Uh, after my undergraduate, after my PhD, I got a, a, a lecturer position, academic position at Monash, a permanent position, and I got a, um, a contract in the Netherlands as a data mining specialist in a, uh, in, a, in, a uh, in a company. I took the industry because I've always wanted to say I'm never going to be a teacher or an academic, but I have settled down finally after so many years. But somehow that uh, the, it's the the, 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 this opportunity to travel, work with, and so on, people all over the world, and people with, who who think differently, and you know, have uh, this kind of. To, uh, what do we do? We are trying to make the world a better place in our own different whether it's artificial intelligence, humanities, health, uh, social sciences, or whatever we do. So to be in that community, that I would say is the it's fully worth that. And I'm settled. I've tried so many different. I've tried many times to. You get into industry and I'm not saying industry, industry now, of course, there are research in there, but being an academic, we continue to develop this. We study, reading is part of my job. I get paid to read and, <laughs> all right, I know, sorry to be <laughs> Yes, that's okay, Professor Dhan, that's very interesting. So Dr. Tanuja, so networking, so. Yeah, networking, of course, yes, it's I to agree with everybody was talking about this networking. Basically, for a PhD student, for a PhD student, uh, I'm not talking about the researchers. Different researchers, of course, you have a different. You can get a grant and you do various stuff. But for a for a PhD student, and how networking happens is the first thing is through these conferences. So best thing is uh, yes, you target the journals because then it will you, you can up, upgrade your your profile. But how networking happens is, is through you publishing uh, in, in a lot of uh, international conferences and physically present. But nowadays, how what happens is like uh, almost all the conferences happen online where you don't have a, a physical participation. But when you actually go, uh, there only you meet people and you network with people and all that. 
So I think we lost that because of this uh, COVID pandemic. And the other thing is that not only this international networking, you, you should be truly network around the university. For a PhD student at University of Moratu, I think University of Moratu is one of the best place for you to talk about this multidisciplinary talents, which is available at one place. So if you just just go out from your, your department or the faculty and talk to different people in, in other, other faculties. Of course, you will find fantastic people who are doing different research because we, we aligned in the way that we have a specialities which is not going all over, but we focus and, and people, people have different interests. Now, recently we, we have this faculty of medicine as well. So we find people with a lot of, you know, as what uh, Professor Alha Kohn was talking about this, uh, different uh, medical field people up there in, in, the, in the, the university. So I think networking has to happen uh, outside the country as well as, well as inside. So where you can get a lot of support as a student, you can, yes, you can get a lot of support and you can get a lot of um, you know, experience shared by um, various academics, even if you just sit and you know, lunch together in the department. So you will gain as the PhD students with the senior academics, you will learn something. So uh, I think that's that's what important is networking. Of course, it's hundred percent, two hundred percent. It's it's important for every PhD student because that's what you you bring. Because you, I I think it's forty years back. Probably it's isolated. You sit down and do your research and then go. But now it is not. You get multiple devices, multiple areas. You know, it's a group of effort, and you disseminate your knowledge with the others via networking. I think that is important. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tanuja. That's very insightful and I think very important for the PhD journey. Right. Yes. Okay. I think uh, we are now right uh, coming to the end of our time for this uh, session. So before we wind up, uh, uh, I would like to ask a hypothetical from our PhD uh, travelers. So now I'm giving you a, a time machine, uh, Tisara and Dr. Nosrat. I want you to travel to your first days uh, in your PhD journeys. So what do you want to tell yourselves? Now we are going to start your journey. Dr. Nusrat? Um, I would say don't be afraid to ask for help because if, unless you communicate, so basically I'm, what I'm saying is communication is extremely important. Unless you communicate what you want to do, what your requirements are, what your personal circumstances are, what your interests are, your supervisor, your mentors are not going to be able to guide you uh, in the correct direction. So don't be afraid to ask for help. And it's absolutely okay to not know the answer to everything because that's what we are in this for. So it's a journey, we discover new things, we are learning new things. So it's okay to not know everything. It's, no, it's okay to feel lost. That is, it's okay to feel stressed. That's all part and parcel of uh, being a PhD student, the PhD journey, uh, you will get there in the end. Um, so it's totally okay to feel lost and you definitely need to ask more questions. So, Kisara, what about you? What so, you yes, I, I completely agree with Dr. Nusrat what she said. So, yes, uh, I think uh, for me also the same. So it's the communication, the key. I think you have to uh, you have to communicate and uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. And also, I would say if I look at my journey, I would say uh, the networking. So I, I also would emphasize the fact, fact of enhancing the networking and also welcoming different perspectives and also it's okay to have a pause and uh, and also it comes down to the commitment and dedication so it's all about uh, never give up so it's all about like having a pause or it's okay to have a pause and then to understand that it's the journey and then to progress thank you tisara oh okay uh, summing up i think i think you know we are like uh, have to give some q and a time as well so um, I think we talked about the people who are starting the journey and thinking about starting the journey. So I would like to sum up with that, like talking about or helping the people who are in the middle of things. I think they deserve most of the help. So uh, Professor Daminder, Dr. Tanuja, uh, what is your advice to those that are in the middle of their journey at the moment? How would you help, how, how would you advise them to like, to quickly achieve their goals 
or what if they are at crossroads at the moment? Dr. Tanuja? Uh, I would say plan it properly. If you are in the middle, uh, because you have halfway through, you came a journey. Uh, if you feel lost, if you feel that I don't know where exactly I'm standing right now, discuss, communicate, and plan yourself. Plan, not yourself, plan the PhD for the rest of your half of your PhD because halfway through you came and then plan the rest very properly. And for that, you if you can't do it alone, seek the support probably from yourself. First person needs to talk is your supervisor, your mentor, mentor, your guide, uh, guide and uh, your supporter. But not don't, don't stop from there. You can speak to the people who are ahead of your schedule, a little bit ahead. Somebody who is closer to the end of your journey. And um, you can specifically talk to the people who have just done, right? If you have just done, you, those people are the best people to help you. And um, now, uh, now the other thing is that you, you should be speak to yourself. What exactly you really want to do within the rest of the half do you really want to finish it or do you, do you really need some more time? Do you need a break? So what exactly you want to do? I think planning has to be the best thing. You need to plan. You need to speak to the supervisor. You need to speak to the people who actually have gone through and uh, people who have actually finished uh, the journey and a little bit ahead the schedule. So I, I also had the same issue. I had I, I will share that experience. I, had, I have one student. Um, I was like um, uh, talking to her and doing, you know, with the research work. I felt at one point, the thing what I'm trying to say, uh, the, the level of maturity in the research, what I, my, me expecting, me as the supervisor, expecting the students to be, she has not reached up to that level. After, after coming in so, so much of time, uh, she has not come into that level. So what I did was I asked uh, her to, you know, that student to speak to another student uh, who is ahead of her schedule, his schedule, where that student can help the other student who is lagging behind. So I felt that I cannot do it. I cannot see through the lenses of a student at that point. I felt that. So I asked that student, okay, will you be able to help this, 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 uh, your friend and speak to her and tell this is what is lacking. And this is what my expectation is exactly. And um, uh, because I felt that I, 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 what I did was like I guided her and then she corrected it actually. And, um, and the friend is also helped because the friend is ahead of, of her schedule. So I think you, you need to speak and you need to understand, you need to, plan and everything um, uh, if you if you really want to finish it on time if you are in the middle right uh, dr tanja thank you uh, i think uh, now we i think it's better to now move on to the, the questions posed by the audience because otherwise we will not have time to go through them as well uh, so i'll quickly uh, convey them to you so one question i think uh, i'll just post to the panel one of you can answer uh, there's this question i would like to raise a question how to choose your supervisor? Maybe uh, Dr. Nusrat? Um, that's a difficult question to answer, but from my experience, I would say uh, you would need to choose your supervisor based on two things. One is what your um, field of research is, what your interests are and see if there's a mutual interest and you know if he's an expert in the field, uh, he or she. And then um, how you know how the other thing is how well you can get along with that person. What is that person's uh, work ethic? What is his work style? Uh, whether you know how is his uh, method of you know supervising students? You could maybe perhaps talk to other uh, students that supervisor has uh, tutored or mentored and see if what their comments are on that. So yeah, it's basically two things, the style of supervising and you know the field of expertise or research, I would say. I think that clears up that question. Thank you, Dr. Nasr. Dr. So Dr. Tanoja, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll throw this to you. 
uh, sometimes a research student doesn't have the luxury of choosing the supervisor or the study area of their preference when we consider funding opportunities. What's your advice to these students? Uh, uh, now, if I if I uh, answer that question uh, from the side of University of Monotu, uh, in University of Monotu, we do have a right, the student has the entire right to select the supervisor. We are not giving supervisors for the students. We are not allocating the supervisors for the students unless uh, the student requests uh, from uh, a particular department or the FGS, I need a supervisor for the, this type of a research. If you don't say that the student is having the 100% right to select your supervisor. Now, in terms of funding options, sometimes uh, where you get the funding is, uh, is for the supervisor applies for the funds and supervisor gets it and then you advertise for a student. So then even with that, you, you as a student, you go because you have interest for the research and you have interest to work with the advertised supervisor. So there also you have a hundred percent, you know, right for you to select the supervisor uh, from that debt. So um, we our all uh, the expertise areas and the relevant people is available in the University of Monterey website where you can search your title. Now, say for an example, if you want um, uh, now uh, probably artificial intelligence or whatever it is, uh, machine learning or whatever IT. Uh, stuff so you just type and see whether whether it comes or not so there are people who has interest in that so it comes all the supervisors it comes so you can have a chat with them and, and select your supervisor the freedom is given there for the students at university of Maratu. so professor Dabminda, maybe anything for you to add there like in terms uh, of yeah just supervisor. quickly um, uh, yeah uh, I, I i agree and it's very important to uh, have that uh, be able to work well closely uh, with the supervisor. So, I mean, uh, just going, uh, perhaps this might be a bit of an extreme uh, uh, sort of statement, but I would say if you, during your sort of communication, feel that there are major conflicts, I would say don't, don't do it. Uh, that is really, really important because why put yourself through? I mean, a marriage, would you? <laughs> it's like that. So it's like that, I, mean, I, I, I know all of you know what, <laughs> understand what I'm, what I'm saying, but very, very close relationship where you are, um, you need that um, uh, mentoring, that very close, uh, you know, it's not just the help, but uh, being with you in that journey as we talked about all this time. So a person you are, even in your initial communication, having conflicts, don't, don't, don't go there. So I'm sure there are <laughs> others who, uh, you match match your sort of interests, your personality better. Yeah, I think that answered the question. Professor Daminda, there is a directed question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so it says, uh, it asks, uh, how do you instill the practice of ethical research in your students? Well, it's for, for, uh, yeah, for number one, <laughs> by being ethical <laughs> and demonstrating what it is myself. Uh, and uh, I have a, a, a team of people now where uh, the, from, from very senior PhDs who are just writing up to those. Uh, and they have gone through this process. There are staff members but, you know, and all, all that. So, and uh, right at the beginning, I think in the first few weeks, uh, the, the ethics uh, of the, the, the practical, uh, the, the practicality of you know um, uh, ethical practice. Uh, I sort of have, have this conversation, and the university has uh, uh, a certain even even um, a school, you can say courses or um, those are online uh, courses that they have to do. A student has to do, staff member has to do, uh, where the, the, you you have to sort of go through, read some material, and answer some questions, and you have to pass that to be uh, whether it's a student or a or, or a staff member. Um, uh, but uh, continuously, I think as things update, um, to, 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 uh, I do sort of point out and uh, direct the students uh, of what ethics mean. And especially in an area like artificial intelligence, uh, things are changing. Uh, so it's very important. And there's a uh, they, they, they quote uh, this uh, from, from, uh, from uh, Spider-Man, I think, just because you have you know, all these very uh, special powers, uh, you, have, you have to be... You know, so, so you have to be very careful because you're working with these techniques, it's giving you so much power. So you have to be very responsible uh, as well. So that, because finally it comes to common sense. It's not about uh, um, sort of memorizing a set of rules 
as a human being, whatever our, I think in most uh, the parents, our cultures, whatever religion we, we are, we, 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 we uh, believe in, does give us an idea, of, uh, some, some sense of what is ethical. I think that's the most important thing. Based on that, then we go into the, to the rules and regulations and so on. So if you don't feel good, come to me and then uh, let's discuss that. Uh, so that's I think that, that covered it up nicely, Professor Damini. Thank you. So I think we have a, a few minutes more in our session. And I think uh, I'll take up one more question from the question box. Um, I address to the panel. Uh, some students are so obsessed with publishing. How do you advise students on publishing with respect to quality versus quantity? Maybe I think Dr. Tanuja and uh, Professor Daminda can weigh in. Uh, yeah. Quantity, yeah, quantity and uh, quality matters a lot. Yeah, of course, quality, if you cannot publish, you know, high index quality, you know, 10 journal papers within your PhD journey, it's impossible. So you don't target on impossible things. That is one thing. But the quantity ma 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 is matters as well. You can't say for the whole PhD journey, I published only one, one uh, very uh, with a reputed journal paper. You can't say that. Do you have only one paper? So then you have to say yes. So I think both quantity and quality uh, matters when it comes to a PhD student. So you need to understand if you, that's what I said, that's the supervisor's, um, you know, a job, even to uh, identify by discussing with the student in which area that you can publish for what. Because uh, for a publishing of a journal, it takes about, you know, months to, to review and all that. Sometimes some journals take months to review a paper. And uh, a student should have been waiting for that time. Um, then at the end, when you when there's a rejection, you say, okay, yes, I don't have. So I think quantity, quality, both matters when, when it comes to a PhD. It's a, it's a role of a supervisor and role of a student as well to understand what type of things to be published in journals. I think I elaborated this as well, uh, earlier as well, and what to go into a journal. So uh, I think you don't have to be obsessed with that. So you need to first understand this thing and how many and uh, what, what quality with which goes to where. Thank you, Dr. Thamaj. So I'll quickly throw the ball to you, Professor Daminda. Oh, definitely. Uh, and I'll just, uh, because of the time, I'll quickly. So um, uh, yeah, fully, fully agree. So what you can, because uh, when it comes to uh, the quality, it's quality is important. So what, uh, in addition to what Dr. Tanuja was saying, what you have to do, make sure that you don't uh, publish or get uh, dragged into these disreputable journals or, or, or even conferences. There are conferences just for the purpose of money-making and uh, tourism. And there are journals, again, just to get the numbers up and you know this uh, H-index and so on, this game of H-index and so on. We have to, it's good to have that, but with the right uh, type of publication. For example, there are other, you have to. So how do you do that? What you can do is when you right, look at the, uh, ad, um, the 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 advisory boards, the committees, and so on, and just uh, I think you can Google. But also generally, your supervisor will know a little bit about these people and help you to do that. Uh, I can give a quick example. Is that the universities also keep a tag on that? They're recently, or, or that was about six months ago. Sorry, I got an email from the university. This uh, quality uh, sort of research quality sort of division saying that are you uh, in the advisory board board of this journal? I said never heard of it. Say so your name is there. So they do check and say that it's a a, a journal which is sort of uh, so they are using people's names, academics' names, in their advisory board. Uh, there is a website. To, so that uh, the people will uh, get and then there are uh, because journals also have started because open access uh, thousands of dollars three to four thousand US dollars in, in and more in some cases and uh, so this becomes the moment the money goes in sadly it becomes big business and uh, the, so you have to sort of uh, make sure that you publish of course the quantity is important the more quality journals you can publish is good but what is quality so there are le different levels. As a PhD starting, you won't be able to publish in a so-called A star or a you know high impact. But still, it's a good the journal with a good uh, uh, reputation. So that's I think something that you have to work with your PhD supervisor uh, to to identify. 
Thank you, Professor Daminder. Thank you very much. So it has been a very uh, interesting, I would say highly interesting uh, discussion. Uh, it was, I think, very helpful for our PhD travelers. And I warmly thank the panel for taking their time and placing us with this uh, opportunity to have this discussion and your contributions has been immensely helpful. I think that will be very useful for our PhD students. So again, thank you very much. So uh, with that, I'll wind up this session and uh, hand over things to you. Kalindu, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it was a very interesting session. And uh, thank you again. Uh,